This is a brief lecture on osteoarthritis treatments, including innovative options such as pentacillin. I'm Dr. David Samra. I hope this information is useful to you. It's really for people who are trying to understand more about the science and evidence around osteoarthritis and the science around pentacillin, including its mechanisms of action and where it fits in in the overall management of osteoarthritis. Um, from here on, that will be termed OA. Please note this is for educational purposes only and does not constitute the giving of medical advice. It's really important to understand what inflammation is in order to understand how to manage osteoarthritis. Inflammation is part of the body's innate immune response to perceived damage or infection with chemical signals that help bring blood flow and cells to come and repair and mop up debris. And this is also associated with redness, warmth, heat and swelling. Now many doctors, including myself, were taught in medical school that osteoarthritis is the degenerative or wear and tear form of arthritis. Now unfortunately, whilst it's true that the hallmark of osteoarthritis is loss of the cartilage between two ends of bone, it's a fairly fatalistic approach to osteoarthritis management because even as of 2021, there is no treatment that can replace cartilage. So if we understand that inflammation is both part of the process of osteoarthritis, but also contributes to the destruction of cartilage, we can understand how to manage it more effectively. So it's important to understand three aspects to osteoarthritis. Firstly, the severity on x-rays and MRI in terms of loss of joint space and loss of cartilage doesn't correlate well with what the patient reports in terms of symptoms and impairment. Secondly, the inflammation we're referring to here is absolutely critical in both the pathogenesis, in, in other words, the development of osteoarthritis, but also the progression and therefore the treatment of osteoarthritis. And thirdly, and I think most importantly to take from this short lecture, is that lifestyle-based treatments are the most effective in managing systemic inflammation in the body and therefore contributing to reduced pain in the joints, particularly when there's multiple joints involved. So while the focus really should be on these evidence-based forms of treatment for osteoarthritis, and these include sustainable forms of exercise, weight management, biomechanical tools, sometimes the judicious use of anti-inflammatory medications. By the time most patients are seeing a sport and exercise physician, they're looking for some form of adjunctive treatment for their pain. And often that means injections to many patients. But injections, although they're very easy to administer and receive, are like icing on the cake. It's our job as physicians to ensure that patients have baked their cake before we add that icing on top. And this is because adjunctive tools like corticosteroid injections, platelet-rich plasma injections, or hyaluronic acid are not without risks, and their effect size or their benefits are shown by research to be lower on average than compared to exercise or diet. Now, hyaluronic acid, is used to help replenish a molecule that's important to maintain viscosity of joint fluid. PRP is used to try to modulate inflammation in the joints through the use of platelet cell signaling that's extracted from the patient's blood. Cortisone injections are a synthetic form of cortisol, our own hormone, which dampens down inflammation at a fairly high level. And while these injections do have evidence of effectiveness for pain and function in osteoarthritis, the vast majority of studies are of poor quality. And in particular, it's important to realise it becomes very difficult to treat patients who have multiple arthritic joints and many arthritic joints with these treatments. Um, and so this form of arthritis we refer to as generalised nodal osteoarthritis. And a systemic treatment that could target multiple joints would be in preference to these localised injections. 
And this is where systemic treatments like pentacetin have gained a lot of interest in the mainstream media over the past couple of years. Pentacetin is a semi-synthetic polysaccharide. All that is, is lots of sugar molecules stuck together with varying lengths and side chains. And these variable sulfate side chains make it very difficult to synthesize chemically. So for this reason, it's semi-synthetic and it's obtained and extracted from the bark of beech trees. It's important to realize this is not a new drug. It has been around in a number of different forms for many years. And in particular, it's been used in Europe as a blood thinner. It has a chemical structure very similar to the gold standard blood thinner known as heparin. And just like heparin, it's injected under the fat of the skin or the thigh um, um, and, uh, or on the stomach. So it's been TGA approved for over 30 years as a, uh, an oral medication called Elmeron. And this has been used to treat a painful bladder condition called interstitial cystitis. And animal studies, interestingly, have shown that the injectable form of pentacin achieves much higher tissue levels than the oral form. And we call this bioavailability. And this seems to be the reason for the difference as to why injectable forms might benefit OA, but the oral form does not. Scientists have been brimming with enthusiasm for this drug as a potential disease-modifying agent in OA for many years, but to date the research hasn't been strong enough in humans to support that. They propose multiple theoretical mechanisms, and whenever you hear that a treatment such a complex common problem is promising, you really need to be careful not to fall for the romance of this uh, newly touted wonder drug. And it's important to think critically. What you have to realise is that scientists have been working tirelessly for decades to understand the mechanisms behind osteoarthritis, and they've explored countless lifestyle changes and drugs targeting various biochemical and physiological pathways with limited success to date. It's really key to understand that even as of now in 2021, there is still no agent that is considered to be able to reverse osteoarthritis or term itself a disease modifying osteoarthritis drug. And so with the enormous prevalence of OA around the world, there is a huge financial incentive or reward to be had by any company that can produce such a drug. So we have to be alert for conflicts of interest. And again, the evidence suggests the most potent effects on pain and inflammation and function in patients with OA come from the down-to-earth lifestyle-based approaches, optimizing exercise, diet, biomechanical aids, and certainly strength. Now, while Pentacen might be a valuable symptom modifier, I remain, and certainly many of my colleagues remain unconvinced that it is a disease modifying drug. Off label prescribing happens all the time in medicine. The definition simply is to be prescribing a medicine for an unintended indication, unintended demographic, or root. And since many of the uh, physicians around the world are treating young patients for whom many drugs were never tested and, uh, and, and passed in terms of TGA approval, many medicines have not been designed for those patients and would be considered off-label. Pentacin is an off-label medication when used in an injectable form, and currently it requires a TGA special access scheme approval where the patient and doctor um, accept responsibility for ensuring it is safe and monitored. And that involves full medical history, written informed consent, potentially being part of a research um, study if the recruitment is still open and um, ongoing monitoring whilst the patient has been prescribed the drug. Certainly myself as a sport and exercise physician, I'm no stranger to off-label prescribing. Sport and exercise physicians pride themselves in being at the front of the innovation curve, trying to provide safe, non-prohibitive treatments to athletes under our care. And so they can return to play and have their ex recovery accelerated 
from injury or illness in a safe manner. But in order to ensure the risks are outweighed by the benefits, legitimate off-label prescribing should fit into three categories. One, where it is being done in a research setting. Two, where there are extraordinary circumstances related to the health of the patient and there being no alternatives. And three, where there is high quality evidence. So just because your horse or elite athletes are getting pentasan doesn't mean you should. Now the mechanisms by which pentasan influences joint pain have been studied for decades in animals and humans. A seminal paper here by Dr. Peter Gosch, published over 20 years ago, outlined a large number of different sites and mechanisms of action. In summary, it's thought to act on the cells of the cartilage, underlying subchondral bone, and the lining of the joint, the synovium, in order to modulate the production of inflammatory chemicals, degradative enzymes, and also to change and improve the blood flow to the underlying bone. It's now understood that the blood flow to this part of the bone is crucial in both the onset and progression of osteoarthritis. And the improvement in bone marrow lesions, which you can see here, these white lesions seen on MRI, seem to correlate well with resolution of pain. There's only one published randomized controlled trial in humans and this is the gold standard type of trial to help assess whether a treatment is safe and effective. In 2005, the researchers uh, that conducted this study recruited 114 patients with OA of the knee based on x-rays and symptoms, and they randomly allocated 54 into the Pentasan group and 60 into a placebo group. They gave the Pentasan patients two injections in their muscle per week and the other group were given salty water injections. Both groups were blinded to which, where they, whether they were receiving the pentasan. And the results demonstrate that the patients in the pentasan group had a statistically improved level of pain that amounted to approximately one out of 10 on a 10 point pain score. Now, this was maintained out to six months but it's important to note a couple of things. Firstly, one out of 10 for a level of pain might not be considered clinically relevant to many patients. And also the trustworthiness of this study was affected by the fact that they had a huge dropout rate. By the six month mark, there was just one third of patients remaining in the study. And certainly more patients withdrew from the, the placebo group. And they also discovered there was almost a two-year difference in the duration of OA symptoms with the pentasan, patients in the pentasan group having less uh, duration of their symptoms. So they could have been better off to start with. Now, this is a more recent trial, and this, this is unpublished data I'm showing you that can be found online at this website. It's a company that I have no affiliation with at all and certainly no uh, relevant conflicts of interest to declare. They are named Paradigm Biopharma, and their goal is to repurpose pentasan um, in an injectable form for osteoarthritis use. They performed a 2A trial comparing pentasan against placebo, and they really found quite simply that there was an apparent benefit without any significant harms. So you can see here the data released by the company show that for moderate severity OA, there's a statistically different um, benefit between the pentasan group and the placebo in terms of the number of patients who had at least a 50% improvement in their pain. And that's what we would call clinically meaningful. And so it was over double the number of patients compared to placebo. Now, looking at the rest of their, um, their data, other than pain, they showed improvements in function. They also showed improvements in the, um, the overall pain score. And they also showed an improvement in terms of the bone marrow lesions that were found. Uh, and 
the area of bone marrow lesions seems to correlate fairly well with pain, as I mentioned. Um, now, before we get too excited, there's still a few un unanswered questions uh, relating to quality parameters and the peer review process. This is not yet published, this data. So a published version will answer questions about the withdrawal and dropout rate and how comparable the two groups were. In other words, were there any factors other than pentasan that might have influenced whether one group was better than the other? And what I thought was a particularly progressive feature of this study was the fact that they measured the uh, MRI at baseline and at the end of the study, and they also looked at biomarkers of cartilage breakdown. And their findings support the concept that much of the pain and underlying pathology in OA relates to bone marrow lesions um, under the, the areas of lost cartilage. Now we know that the articular cartilage that covers the ends of bone have no nerve endings, so they cannot directly cause pain. And so it makes sense that the underlying bone is a source of pain. But these pharmaceutical researchers have shown that the reduction in the bone marrow lesions that occurred in patients in the pentosan group correlated with improved pain. Now this has important implications for other areas of the body where surgery is not a great option and is often required in the end. Now this includes conditions like osteolysis of the distal clavicle, uh, which commonly occurs in swimmers, osteitis pubis, which commonly occurs in patients uh, in players of running and kicking sports, modic end plate changes in the, in the lumbar spine, and even AVN of the of joints, including the hip, which are, as I mentioned, often all of these can lead to surgery. But most importantly, I think that pentasan may have a role and be worth being considered in what's called nodal generalized osteoarthritis, where multiple joints are involved and uh, the disease appears to have more of an inflammatory component um, than single joint osteoarthritis. So it might be a useful treatment for these patients. Now, pentasan also has a small profile of evidence of case series that have been performed in the treatment of alpha virus infections like Ross River virus and chikungunya disease. And the problem with these infections is that traditional medical treatments like anti-inflammatories and analgesics are very limited and ineffective. And a further problem is that when we do trials on immune suppressive drugs to try and dampen down the immune system, things like prednisone, methotrexate, things that rheumatologists often will prescribe, unfortunately, that uh, increases patients' pain and leads to increased levels of viral replication. So they're stuck between a rock and a hard place in many ways, these patients. And um, what we are now finding is that perhaps there are immunological mechanisms for the action of molecules like pentasan on the adaptive immune system, not just the innate immune system. And so this field of medicine is rapidly exploding. It's called the metabolomics field. And it goes far deeper and broader than fields like genomics, where we've done the, the Human Genome Project. And it's because we're learning more about the interactions between these polysaccharide particles with immune cells and how they alter signaling pathways that affect all sorts of things like blood flow, in terms of blood flow to the underlying bone and arthritis, inflammation, and certainly the way that the parts of the, the immune system interact and even in cancer um, and tumorigenesis and how cancers develop. So while we can get carried away and excited about the basic science, the real test is going to be publication of a well-designed randomized control trial comparing placebo to standard treatment, uh, to pentasan, um, and really to understand looking at these patients whether there's a clinically meaningful difference. And so until convincing data are published and we see that it has been peer reviewed, pentasan remains an off-label medication, an adjunctive treatment that is simply icing on the cake and patients really need to bake the cake first. 
I create educational videos like this to help empower patients by allowing them to understand their problem, treatment options, and the expected recovery. I do hope you found this information useful, and if you'd like to delve into further reading, I've listed some key resources and references with links found on my website. Remember, this lecture is for educational purposes, does not constitute the giving of medical advice, and no patient-doctor relationship is formed.